When we worked on this previously, we mainly focused on the level of potential and the level of the energy. But at the end, I talked about the idea that what we usually care about is the change in potential and the change in energy. Because when you just look at the potential, you're just comparing a point in space to infinity, usually. But we don't usually care about infinity. We care about two points in space. So this is, could be what we would call the potential difference. Uh, another name for the potential difference is the voltage. So let's review what that means. Let's say we have here a capacitor. What does it mean if I tell you that the potential difference across this uh, capacitor is 9 joules per coulomb? How can we interpret that? If we say that the potential difference across this capacitor is 9 joules per coulomb. A capacitor is something that has a separation of charges. Um, how much for one coulomb charge to go from one side of the capacitor to the other, it takes 9 joules of energy? That's good. Put the number one down here. This would say that if we move a 1 coulomb charge between the plates, its potential energy would change by 9 joules. Notice that potential determines the level of energy, but potential difference determines the change in energy. So this is telling us about a 9 joule change in energy. If we go from one plate, if we move a 1 coulomb charge between these plates, its energy will change by 9 joules. Whether it, its energy increases or decreases depends on what direction we're moving in. Um, but this is telling us that if we move a 1 coulomb charge between the plates, its energy will change by 9 joules, which means that if we move the 1 coulomb charge in the direction it doesn't want to go, we'd have to do 9 joules of work to do that. Let's do a question that's almost identical to this. Suppose I tell you that the voltage difference in this capacitor is 5 volts. How, what does that tell us about the capacitor? Um, it, a one coulomb charge moving from one plate to another um, would have experienced a potential energy difference of five um, joules. Good. That's good. This was almost identical to the previous question. It's just one step harder because in order to interpret this, you need to replace the volts with joules per coulomb. And then you can see this is telling us that if we move a 1 coulomb charge between these two plates, its potential energy will change by 5 joules. Well, the, there's a simple lesson here. The lesson is that volts are an important unit, but they're not very interpretable. So when you're doing a problem with volts, very often you should change that into joules to, per coulomb just so you understand what you're dealing with. So if you see a volt, very often you should change that into joules per coulomb so it's easier to interpret what it means. Uh, one thing to emphasize that we saw last time Potential and potential energy are two different things. We talked about how unfortunate it is that they only differ by one word. So it's easy to confuse them, but they're completely different. You can see they have different units. This is in joules, and this is in joules per coulomb. But obviously, they're very related. That's why the names are so similar. The potential difference determines what the energy difference will be. But they're still two different things. By the way, suppose that we move a 3 coulomb charge between these plates. What would its energy change be? Yeah. So even though this only tells us directly about the energy change for one Coulomb charge, we saw it's still very useful for any amount of test charge. We can just do some unit manipulation to figure out this will be 15 joules. Or we can use the formula we saw last time. Here's the relationship between the energy change and the voltage change, which is very similar to the formula that relates the level of the energy and the potential. And those are very similar to the formula, it should all be in terms of the test charge, that relates the force in the field. These are all in your flow chart, but these are very basic formulas. These formulas should be just obvious from the units. Coulombs times newtons per coulomb is newtons, or coulombs times joules per coulomb is joules. So these formulas just follow from the units.
Oh, now we can start thinking about circuits. We need to be familiar with some of the common symbols in circuits. Uh, do you know what this symbol stands for? Um, no. So this would be a power source. Usually we'll think of this as a battery. This is a battery or some other power source that's supplying the energy for the circuit. The key thing is that there's two uneven lines. Two uneven lines. Okay. By the way, your textbook uses a more complicated symbol, I think. It uses two pairs of uneven lines. So you need to be able to recognize this. But on the blackboard, it's simpler. And in your work, it's probably simpler just to do one pair of uneven lines. But these two things mean the same thing. They're both batteries. The longer line represents the positive terminal. And the shorter line represents the negative terminal. You know from using a battery that the terminals are always labeled plus and minus. There's always the positive and the negative terminal. In this notation, the side that ends in the longer line would be the positive terminal, and the side that ends in the, the shorter line would be the negative terminal. Now, in a sense, though, it's really maybe not so good that we use plus and minus for this, because the plus and minus don't actually stand for positive and negative charges. You shouldn't really think of this as positive and negative. What they really stand for is plus stands for high potential, and negative stands for low potential. So you should really think of the plus as standing for high potential, and the negative is standing for low potential. We're not saying that this actually has a positive charge. We're just saying that it's at a high potential. Charges there can achieve a high potential. Well, let's uh, consider a current. A current is when there's charges moving through this circuit. Now, theoretically, if you have moving charges, there could be either positive charges moving or negative charges moving, either positive or negative charges moving through the, the circuit. Um, now, in, in general conventional circuits, what's really moving? What's really moving is the electrons. So what's really moving is the negative charges. Um, however, uh, I think it was uh, Benjamin Franklin who invented a lot of the concepts in this area. And when Benjamin Franklin was working on electricity, he didn't know whether it was the positive or the negative charges that were moving. And I think he basically just took a guess. He took a guess, and he guessed that it was the positive charges that were moving in the circuits. Um, and he had a 50-50 chance, but he happened to guess wrong. For regular circuits, it's the negative electrons that are moving. Um, so as a result, it's conventional to think of the current as positive charges. And that actually turns out to be very important when you're doing problems. The current is thought of as the movement of positive charges. Even though, in a sense, that's kind of imaginary, because in regular current circuits, it's really the electrons that are moving. But we're still going to think of current as a movement of positive charges. And it turns out that you end up getting all, pretty much all the right answers, as long as you're consistent with that, even though it, it doesn't represent reality. Well, let's think about where would positive charges rather be? Would positive charges, do positive charges want to move to a higher or low potential? And this will give us a chance to practice some of the concepts that we talked about last time. Um, so let's see if we can work that out. So let's say we have some positive test charges. Well, first of all, do you remember that do positive test charges want to move to a high energy or a low energy? They want a low energy. But where will they find a lower energy? Will they find a lower energy where potential is high or potential is low? Um, where potential is high. Let's see if we can work that out. No, no, no. That's not true. Where, sorry, it's where potential is low. Here's our formula that relates potential and energy. And remember, we're thinking about a positive charge. Well, if we're thinking about a positive charge, how do we make energy as low as possible? Should we make V big or make V small? Um, make V small. Because there's a positive relationship between these two concepts. We talked about this a little at the end of our last session. Potential and potential energy move in the same direction as each other. Mm -hmm. um, so 
the charge would want to move to a low potential. Remember that we saw that a good intuitive understanding for a potential, we can think of potential as representing height, or we can think of delta V as representing the change in height. That's only for positive charges. Remember that for negative charges, potential represents lowness or depth, which is more confusing. But for positive charges, V represents height. Well, do things want to increase their height or decrease their height? So that would indicate that we want to lower our potential. 